there. Welcome. I'm just uh, go ahead and get started on uh, this year's CCE program from first to fifth grade. It's good to see everybody here. And uh, got some new faces and faces I know from last year. Got some probably first graders, kindergartners, and uh, great to have everybody uh, here. So what we're going to do is just uh, kind of do an overview of uh, what the kids will be going through tonight. And then we'll also be overviewing a little bit of what the two chapters would be about that you would go through them in, and with them. And the only difference is we're just doing this at, on an adult level to help you guys grow in faith as you help your kids uh, grow in faith. So it's kind of just the uh, church partnership with you guys uh, with uh, CCD. So it's definitely a, important you know, for the uh, children to have their kid, have their parents, uh, you know, bring them up in the faith to see their parents practice the faith and uh, live out the faith. And so we'll just be going through some uh, easy ways to be able to do that, as well as just providing some uh, knowledge of our uh, faith as well. Tonight we'll be talking about divine revelation, faith, and prayer, and how all those three relate. And uh, so we'll just start with a little prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, we give thanks for the gifts you've given us this summer. We give thanks for our families. We ask you to please bless these parents and their children as they keep growing closer to you, Lord Jesus. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And just uh, real quickly, uh, one of the neat things about God's divine revelations, he can reveal himself to us in many different ways. I'll talk about those. And then faith is our response to God revealing himself to us. And faith is actually a gift from God. And then, and then on our part, um, we respond to that gift of faith that we're given. So we have a free choice and an action to take in response to God's revealing himself to us, and then uh, prayer is another way that we can stay close to God and experience His divine revelation. So, uh, in the chapters, there's always a little scripture passage because we always want to stay connected to scripture. That's God revealing Himself to us. So, you guys would review a little scripture passage with them, and there's a couple questions regarding the uh, scripture passage. So, tonight, uh, the suggested one uh, was uh, Psalm 63, verses 1 to 6. And then verse 9, but I want to include verse 7 and 8, so this is a little bit different than your uh, handout. So as I read this uh, scripture passage, just maybe uh, kind of seek a quiet place in your mind and see what word or phrase or sentence maybe uh, sticks out to you in your mind, and that's something that you can maybe think about later on as well. So this is... Uh, from uh, King David in the Old Testament, Psalm 63, it starts out a, a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. God, you are my God. It is you I seek. For you, my body yearns. For you, my soul thirsts. In a land parched, lifeless, and without water. I look to you in the sanctuary to see your power and glory. For your love is better than life. My lips shall ever praise you. I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands, calling on your name. My soul shall be sated as with choice food. With joyous lips, so and all shall praise you. I think of you upon my bed. I remember you through the watches of the night. You indeed are my savior. And in the shadow of your wings, I shall for joy. My soul clings fast to you. Your right hand upholds me. And a couple things that stuck out in that scripture passage to me is um, that desire for God that God plants within us. So we're each created in the image and likeness of God, and God puts within each person a desire for God. And that's kind of uh, what this psalm is talking about. And then it talks about God's response to us. And it says, your right hand upholds me at the end. God helping us out. And even as the psalm says, when our uh, lips are parched and uh, 
we're in a difficult place, a land parched, lifeless. So we can sometimes experience that at different points in life and God is there to help uphold us. And then we're also on for seeking God in those uh, situations. And uh, so as far as uh, God revealing himself to us, it, as far as divine revelation goes, God reveals himself to us in the beauty of creation. We see sunsets, might go to a lake, see different things, beauty, mountains with snow on them, and uh, think, wow, that's amazing. And uh, that can draw us closer to God. Uh, our relationships with people can draw us closer to God. Other people can draw us closer to God. We might notice um, the faith of a person that we know, and just seeing their witness of faith and their words or actions can draw us closer to God as well. Our prayer life can draw us closer to God. God can. Re One neat thing is, each person is an individual creation that will never be repeated. So God has an intimate, or wants an, also wants an intimate relationship with each person that He created, and in that, God can reveal Himself to us in any way that he wants to. God's God. He can do what he wants. He can show us some of his goodness in any way that he chooses. And it can be sometimes when we least expect it or even when we're not looking for it. And then we have more of the formal ways that God revealed himself to us. And that would be sacred scripture and tradition. So we, in sacred scripture, it's really all about God's love story with his creation, that being humanity. God, you see in the Old Testament, God reaching out to the people that he created. You can see that with uh, Abraham. He's known as a man of faith, a great man of faith by uh, St. Paul. And he chooses Abraham to be a father of his people. And he said to Abraham, you, your descendants shall, or the world shall be blessed through your descendants. And who is his descendants eventually? Jesus. So God chooses his chosen people. He wants them close to him. He tries to give them ways to be close to him, like uh, the Ten Commandments. He sends prophets to draw the people to himself. And the ultimate divine revelation is the Son of God, Jesus. And Jesus uh, reveals in a very deep way what we see in the Old Testament as well, which is God's divine love for all of us, each and every person. And uh, we see that in Jesus' teachings that we have written down. We see Jesus' love and the miracles that he did. He helped every single person who asked him for help, and that's a great example for us to consistently go to help, go to him for help in prayer well, we need help and then the miracles that Jesus did those the purpose of those were to help the people believe in his teaching and also I think in his heart you know what he's seeing and the people that asked for his help he's seeing the disorder that original sin caused that being sin death you know the different diseases and uh, it talks about demonic possession in there and he wanted to make things right whenever pers a person asked for help. So those miracles help people believe in all these things that Jesus taught. And the ultimate example of uh, Jesus' divine re revelation of God's love for us is uh, uh, his death on the cross. That speaks really louder than anything because the purpose of him doing that was to draw all people to himself and show us that we have a God who loves us deeply and is willing to suffer at great lengths for us. And in Jesus' death, he gives us freedom from sin and then that gift, great gift of eternal life. So we're not only you know, asking for help today, but moving forward, you know, obviously you ask anybody, do you wanna to go to heaven? Yeah, so we want us, yourselves, your spouses, your kids, all of us to be in that great community of saints in heaven. God gives us that desire to be close to him and also that desire 
to be in heaven with him. And then after Jesus dies, we see the early church. Jesus trains the apostles for three years. Jesus is only in ministry for three years. He trains his apostles to found his church. And in that, we see in the Acts, the apostles, them doing exactly what Jesus asked them to do at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, where he says, go teach the commandments and baptize the nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So when they went to these cities that didn't know Jesus, they taught about Jesus, and people freely uh, accepted what they had to say, and they were baptized and became part of the church. And I think one thing that can attract people to Jesus is, I think within people, we have a desire for truth. Like, what is the ultimate truth? And through that desire for God that God gives us, and the faith that God gives us, deep down when we search, we'll know what the truth is. And uh, that's another gift that Jesus gives us, is that uh, conscience, that desire for the truth, and the ability to know the truth. So I think when people heard the apostles teach about Jesus, they saw something there in what they were saying that affected their hearts in a deep way, and they wanted to make that commitment to be uh, Catholic, and that's uh, really neat. And the apostles on, the, on their side, if I was them, I'm walking to a town that doesn't know Jesus. You know, some of the towns around Middle East did where Jesus died in uh, Jerusalem. And you'd think, how are these people coming to believe? And I think the answer would be God working through those people, drawing them to God, kind of like what I was saying at the uh, beginning. So that's uh, just a little bit on Scripture, that God's divine love story, and God taking the point, and he shows he literally wants to seek people out. That's, that's what he did in the Old Testament, the New Testament, see people out, draw people to himself, show them he's a loving God, he cares for them, wants them close to him, and he will help them. And that's what Jesus showed in his life, and that's what the ministry of the apostles continued, and that's what the church continues as well. You know, we want to constantly be reaching out and bringing people to the love of uh, Christ. And then lastly, I'll mention uh, tradition. So you have scripture on one hand, and then you have tradition. So when you think about, I mentioned Jesus with the apostles for three years. <laughs> think about all the discussions that he would have had with them, teaching them how to read the Old Testament. It says that the, after he died, that Jesus opened their minds and their hearts to understand the scriptures, and in the scriptures, he taught them how the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, what those have to say, and what they say about him. So the Old Testament's very connected with the New Testament. Jesus quotes the Old Testament many times, and like Advent, we'll hear in the first reading from the Old Testament, we'll hear about how the prophets or the law or the Psalms, maybe not the Psalms, but you send a Psalm, but uh, we hear about the different prophecies about the birth of Christ. And some of them are just like dead on, talking about a virgin being with child. And, and Lent, in the first reading of the Old Testament, we hear what the prophets have to say about the death of Jesus. Like the prophet Isaiah, he says exactly what happens in Jesus' death. And then we also see that in the book of uh, Wisdom. So those are some uh, scripture connections. So getting back to Jesus talking to the apostles, so he's talking with them for th three years. You can't fit all those conversations into scripture. Right? And uh, so then what St. John wrote at the end of his gospel, he wrote, there are not enough, there is not enough room in the world con to contain the books about the works of Jesus. That's crazy. 
So the tra that's where the tradition fits in, where it has to do with the teachings of Jesus and also the early practices of the faith. So just to give an example about the Mass, so like we have the words of consecration, the Eucharist, where the priest says, this is my body given up for you to do this in memory of me, this is my blood, go out and do the covenant, take away, uh, or for the forgiveness of sins, do this in memory of me. We see that in the Gospels at the Last Supper. St. Paul repeats those same words of consecration twice in his letters, and then he talks about celebrating the breaking of bread in people's houses because there weren't churches yet. So that's what we have about the early Mass. And then in the year 100, which St. Paul died in the year 65, in the year 100 we have a writing from a guy named Justin, St. Justin Martyr. And he wrote a letter to the current Caesar, the current emperor of the Roman Empire, about Catholicism because early on the Roman Empire said that Catholics were atheists and they were uh, persecuted because they did not worship the Roman gods they did not uh, call Caesar God so depending on who is emperor there's different ways of persecution of the Catholics so that's why Justin is writing about Christ about the scriptures and about how the practice how they were practicing the faith that Jesus uh, gave them in that writing we have a description of the mass from the year 100 and it looks it, it's just about the same as what we have right now you know you have the opening prayers reading from scripture uh, celebration of the Eucharist, saying the Our Father, and uh, so sometimes, you know, there might be some elements that are slightly different, but uh, he's not the only one that we have the account of the Mass from. So then, uh, one other example besides the Mass is uh, Saint John the Apostle. We hear about him uh, from uh, Saint Ignatius of Antioch, Saint Polycarp, and. Uh, St. Irenaeus, those three guys learned the faith from St. John the Apostle. So they would have learned how, to, how Jesus, specifically how Jesus taught them to read the scriptures and uh, you know how to celebrate the Mass, how to practice the faith, live the faith. And we have letters from St. Ignatius and St. Polycarp detailing our Catholic faith, talking about bishops, uh, priests, deacons and their relationship to the people of God as one part. They talk about the Eucharist, they talk about the church elements of our faith. And then St. Irenaeus has a very long work, big book, that we still have. Uh, it's written, the second half is just written almost like a catechism. It's just, this is our faith, this is what we believe, this is how we practice it. And, uh, you know, having something from the early church like that is a great treasure. And uh, so we kind of can see how the tradition of the church works out in the early church from those early writings. So I don't want to put you asleep with all that stuff because I don't expect you to read it all. But I think it's important to know that, like, the Mass just didn't come from nowhere. We've been, pra we've been having the same Mass for almost uh, 2,000 years. And then the treasure of writings that we have from the early church all the way through now demonstrates how the faith was lived out and practiced ever since the apostles started consecrating bishops, priests, and uh, deacons. And we, you know, it's just uh, highly interesting to me at least. And I uh, thought I'd pass it on to you as well. So, uh, so what do we do with the great revelation? that we have. One is you kind of connect that to the desire for God that God gives us. So uh, God comes down and meets us through Jesus. He still comes down and meets us on the altar and the uh, Eucharist, the body, the blood of Christ, the real presence of Jesus. And uh, you know, sometimes you can feel like well, that's great. <laughs> I gotta go to four practices tonight, <laughs> you know. Um, so, 
it's kind of like we have this divine revelation. How does that look in a daily person's life? And even, you know, you can go through different things, different stages of life in the past or present where we think, well, how can I really know that God exists? And, uh, or, um, kind of, you know, never hurts to question things. I think it's good to question things. And, uh, you know, ask questions to me or look them up to good Catholic sources like Catholic Answers online. And uh, so I think also one other good place to look is uh, the lives of the saints. There's really nice write-ups online. So I want to just play two clips just on the existence of God. They're pretty short, but I thought they were uh, pretty good as far as talking about that. I kind of like we had to see a couple of scripture references there, and I think it's interesting that it points towards a little bit of what I was talking about, God wanting that relationship with us. It almost seems uh, impossible that something, somebody as great as God wants to, desires to be that close to us, where he knows us inside and out, he knows our heart, knows our soul, I mentioned uh you know, he knows when a sparrow falls to the ground. He knows how many hairs are on our head. He knows when, when we're in need. And uh, he knows when to help us out. And uh, so that can be, um, you know, sometimes difficult to even uh, comprehend or uh, realize. So I just wanted to mention a couple more things. And one would be um, two other ways to come in to know God. So one would be, uh, just in uh, our life experience, we could take a moment and think back of when did we see God in our life? And a couple examples might be one, you know, maybe a mother holding uh, a new child and seeing the beauty of creation, the beauty of the child, and giving uh, thanks to God and seeing God in that moment. Or I have a lot of experience with. Uh, people unfortunately getting different unfortunate diagnoses and you know they have varying levels of faith they may you know have a deep faith they may uh, not have prayed very much in their life and they feel a strong connection to God but at that point in that time they feel called to pray to God ask for help and develop that connection with God and wherever anybody's at they you know ask me I'm always uh, going to be there, you know, when they uh, get a hold of me for something as serious as that. And uh, the, the last way I want to talk about God besides uh, life experiences is uh, prayer. That's our uh, intimate connection with God. That's one of the most intimate connections with God that we uh, have available to us. So there's a few different, there, one, one beautiful thing about our faith is there's a lot of different ways to pray. We can pray as a community at Mass and uh, enjoy that and uh, hear Scripture, God's divine revelation, and uh, celebrate the Eucharist, receive uh, the love of Christ in the Eucharist, and then we have, you know, conversation with God. It's, it's great, you know, if you guys were able to, if you haven't already, to start teaching your kids about how to converse with God in prayer. It's very simple, and uh, but sometimes it's harder to start out, like, uh, couple examples would be uh, just have them say well what do you have going today and if it's something that's they're stressed out a little bit you know you can teach them how to ask God to help them out that day with that particular thing or as, as the day is over you got a little time just say hey what did anything good happen today for you and you can say, okay, well, why don't we thank God together for it? And you can uh, start just by uh, sign the cross and uh, thank God for that particular thing that happened that day. And so those are simple conversations that we can have with God, but they have uh, deep meaning because when you see kids pray, they really mean it. <laughs> Back when I was at, at, at a church that had a school next to it, if I knew somebody who wanted prayers and really needed prayers, I'd go to like the fourth grade room and like, hey guys, 
can you pray for so-and-so? I just give him the first name. It's like, how is God not going to listen to prayers of these kids? You know, that's like dynamite. <laughs> and uh, so then, you know, sometimes we have uh, people can utilize like prayers that are written out. You know, you got the rosary, but there's all kinds of different prayers. You might have seen them maybe at your relations houses that are a little bit older. A lot of them like uh, having little prayer books next to their uh, chair they sit in say some prayers that are written out because that's how they like to pray. That's an option. Um, you have, you know, praying in church, praying in front of the Blessed Act of the Eucharist. That's a good, great form of prayer. You have pray, praying with uh, scripture. Like, maybe I, you know, if you think about it sometime this year, maybe just slowly read the Gospel of Luke. And uh, it really doesn't take that long to do. But I'd suggest maybe just take a little bit of time each day, just go through the Gospel of Luke as just a personal spiritual practice uh, this year. That'd be something great to do in uh, praying with the uh, Scripture. So, you know, meal prayers, obviously, and he, he kind of, I remember growing up, he used to say that one as, like, as fast as you can. <laughs> Not the best way to pray. Sometimes I just like to say thank you, God, for the food. That's a nice prayer, isn't it? So, uh, I'll, uh, ju just about done here. So this is, uh, what, an example of, uh, these family plus faith pages that they, uh, have for the chapters. And just going over two parts of it. One is, uh, on the upper left, it talks about Revelation and what, what's going on for the next few weeks. Then on the let's talks part on the top right of the first page, those are some nice little questions to get a conversation going uh, with your child just about uh, maybe some personal faith examples, but also what's in the uh, lesson. And then on the bottom, Catholic's belief, that's kind of like the core of what we're talking about and what our beliefs are. And then on the second page in the lower left, there's a little prayer that you can pray, read out and pray together. And then there's some other suggestions. So last year we had talked about, you know, trying to have some type of little prayer space, maybe a crucifix and a little statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary. If you ever needed a place to get them, I could help you out with uh, that. Just, uh, it's kind of nice, you know, kind of showing them, you know, this is a place you pray. You can pray in your bedroom, you can pray anywhere, but having uh, that formal spot can sometimes be a little helpful and have a little family uh, prayer uh, ritual. And then what I like is uh, the book has examples of saints. So a saint is uh, a person who lived a heroically vir virtuous life. There's all kinds of uh, canonized Catholic saints whether they're, uh, you know, family, uh, you know, mom and dad, maybe it's a person who started a religious order, sometimes it's a pope, a priest, or a religious sister, and they go through different uh, saints and people who lived out the Catholic faith uh, with God's help and did it in a great way, and there's pretty much all kinds of different professions within that as well. And then the saint for this week is a famous one. He's uh, St. Augustine. He's one of the greatest uh, theologians of the Catholic Church. And him and St. Thomas Aquinas are the top two pretty much. But St. Augustine lived in three hunters and he lived during the fall of the Roman Empire. And he wrote some great books, but uh, his earlier life, he'd never guessed that he would be one of the greatest theologians and uh, his mother St. Monica he trained she trained him the faith he was he chose not to be baptized and his father was not baptized either and uh, St. Augustine was was a truth seeker and he sought it in education so he he uh, knew everything he tried to know everything he possibly could go into philosophy mathematics everything astrology and uh, he was never content until he found God so that's why 
uh, he has one of these famous sayings. He said, God, you made us for yourself, and my heart is restless until it rests in you. And he wrote a, one of the first books of its time. It's called The Confessions of St. Augustine. And what, that ha what it's all about is his personal spiritual journey coming closer to God. It's a very uh, well-written and uh, interesting book, and he highlights that journey. And one of the parts of the journey was is his mother, St. Monica, constantly praying for her. So, like, he, would, he, he lived in the uh, northern part of Africa, and without telling his mother, he just went to Italy, went to Milan to become a teacher, and then she actually tracked him down and followed him, took the boat to Italy, and found him. And then she started going to church in Milan, and he happened to have St. Ambrose there. Then eventually St. Ambrose or St. Augustine goes to St. Ambrose, talks with him, learns more about the faith, and then eventually converts and is baptized just because he, he searched for the truth everywhere found it within the Catholic Church and the revelation of uh, Jesus. So he's been kind of a great example of the faith. And then if you want to just take a look at the back side of the scripture passage. If you have some time sometime on your own, maybe take a look at those questions and just see you know, those you know, good questions to think about, good questions that can bring us uh, closer to God as well. So I think uh, we'll go ahead and close, take a five-minute break, and the ch kids will be in the uh, uh, church in a little bit. But before we break up, I'll just let you know that if there's anything I can ever help with, any faith questions, anything at all, uh, just let me know. I'm always willing to do what I can, and I definitely appreciate your guys' help in, uh, you know, helping our children of the church here and your children grow closer to God, and hopefully, you know, you, you yourselves as well can grow in faith as well uh, this coming year, and uh, that's it. Thank you.